Hi, I'm Brandon Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the New Mexico Humanities Council. Uh, we're here today at the new International District Branch of the City Library to celebrate Constitution Day 2022. Uh, we're going to be able to have a performance by a Chautauqua performer uh, that's interpreting the life and legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Notorious RBG. Uh, so without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce uh, our uh, first presenter today, Diane Layden. Diane is a semi-retired college professor and writer. Her field is American Studies. Her research interests include New Mexico history and culture, public violence, and social justice. So help me bring on uh, Diane Layden. Good afternoon. I am Ruth Bader Ginsburg. When I passed away, Francesca Zambello, director of the Washington National Opera, said about me, her life is about understanding people's stories. I hope so. First, I want to tell you about how I came by the nickname Notorious RBG. <laughs> in 2013, to highlight my descent in Shelby County versus Holder, a Supreme Court ruling, New York University law student Shana Koniznik coined the term Notorious B RBG based on rapper Biggie Small's nickname, Notorious B.I.G. When I'm asked what Biggie Small's and I have in common, I say, we're both from Brooklyn. <laughs> Shelby County versus Holder rolled back Voting Rights Act of 1965 protections and permitted states, including states with histories of racially motivated voter oppression to change their voting procedures without outside oversight. The majority opinion argued that by 2013, voting discrimination had largely been ameliorated. In dissent, I argued, any improvements in voting fairness were the result of the law. I said, throwing out pre-clearance rules when they have worked and are continuing to work to stop voting discrimination is like throwing away your umbrella during a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. I am Notorious RBG, and I am known for my descents. My birthday is March 15th, 1933. My birth name is Joan Ruth Bader, but there were too many Jones at kindergarten, so I became Ruth from then on. My parents and grandparents were immigrants from Russia and Poland. My father, Nathan Bader, was born in 1896 in Ukraine. He couldn't go to school because he was Jewish. He came to the U.S. with his family when he was 13 years old. He learned English at night school. My mother, Celia Amster Bader, was born in what is now born in the U.S., three months after her parents came over from what is now Krakow, Poland. My father sold fur hats and fur coats and worked long hours just to make ends meet. My mother worked as a bookkeeper in the garment district until her children were born. At that time, it was a mark of respectability to stay home with children. We lived in Brooklyn in the Flatbush section with people who were Italian, Irish, Russian, Polish, Catholic, and Jewish. When I was a child, my childhood activities were riding my bike, roller skating, jumping rope, and from ages 8 to 16, playing the piano. 
In the summer, I went to a Jewish summer camp in upstate New York from ages four to 18 when I became a counselor. At 13, I was chosen to be camp rabbi. <laughs> I led the religious services. I relished public speaking. I also loved riding horses. I am left-handed. When I was a child, teachers tried to change left-handed children to right-handed. I refused. I am still left-handed. On my birthday, my mother took me to an orphanage and we brought them ice cream. My mother taught me to care about other people. On Fridays, she took me to the library. I loved reading, particularly about girls and women who did things, like teenage detective Nancy Drew, Joe March in Little Women, Greek goddesses, Eleanor Roosevelt, Amelia Earhart. My sister Marilyn was four years older. She called me Kiki when I was a baby because I kicked so much. Sadly, Marilyn died at age six of spinal meningitis. I was two. My mother then pinned her hopes on me. She taught me two principles. One, be a lady. And by that she meant stand by my convictions, have self-respect, and have self-control over my emotions to be independent. In those days, just as people were treated differently based on race or skin color, so boys and girls, men and women, were treated differently. Girls were taught to cook and sew. Boys were taught to build things. I wanted to build things. I wanted to do what boys did. Boys might go to college, girls might not. Boys might have careers, girls might have jobs like secretary, teacher, or nurse. Many occupations had names that ended in the word man, police man, fire man, male man, and the professions were dominated by men, doctors, lawyers, professors. When women worked in occupations held by men, they earned much less money. My mother didn't believe in any of that. My mother marched in a women's suffrage parade when she was a girl. She was a brilliant student. She graduated high school three years early. But her father didn't think it was necessary for a girl to go to college, so she went to work and contributed her earnings to send her brother to Cornell University. I was an A student. In middle school, I edited the student newspaper. In high school, I made the honor society. I played cello in the orchestra, not very well. <laughs> and I cheered on the pep squad, twirling my baton. I developed a passion for music and the arts. My mother took me to museums and to the Brooklyn Academy where I saw plays, operas, and ballet. One day, when my parents and I were driving in Pennsylvania, we saw an anti-Semitic sign at an inn, no dogs or Jews allowed. We knew about the Holocaust in Europe and the murders of millions of Jews, and sometimes we had anti-Semitic experiences in Brooklyn. In 1946, my mother developed cervical cancer and for the next four years would spend many months in the hospital. The hospital was a one-hour trip each way. I spent as much time with her as I could. I clung to her bedside. In 1950, she died at age 47, 
two days before my high school graduation. She left me her antique gold circle pin and earrings, which I wore on any occasion when I thought I would particularly do her proud. She also left me $8,000 for my college education, a huge amount of money for her to have saved in the 1940s. I gave a portion to my father, whose business was declining because of the arrival of department stores. I received a scholarship from Cornell University, which is where I thought my mother would have gone if she could have gone to college. I had wonderful professors at Cornell. One of them was the Russian author Vladimir Nabokov, who wrote the novel Lolita. He taught me the importance of words and word order in conveying an image or idea. Other professors taught me about the Constitution and civil liberties, and that I could find a profession in which I could express my values. At Cornell, I did research for my professors on blacklists in the entertainment industry in the 1950s. Senator Joe McCarthy was seeing communists everywhere. And people accused of communism could lose their jobs. I saw the devastating effect of that on those people, even when the accusations may not have been true. I saw the risks taken by lawyers who represented them. And I saw that lawyers could help ensure that people were treated fairly by the law, and I wanted to become a lawyer. But the best thing that happened to me at Cornell was meeting Martin Ginsburg. This was the best thing that happened to me in my life. Marty was the first man who was attracted to me for my mind. We also both loved opera. Otherwise, we were different. I was very short, and he was very tall. I was very serious, sober as a judge, and he was lively and humorous. We were married in 1954, and our daughter Jane was born in 1955, our son James in 1965. I've given you a handout about my legal career. I went to law school at Harvard and Columbia. I transferred my last year to Columbia because Marty, who was a year ahead of me, had graduated and was offered a wonderful job in New York City. I became a law professor at Rutgers and Columbia. I was a co-founder of the Women's Rights Project of the American Civil Liberties Unions, for which I won five of six gender cases before the Supreme Court in the 1970s. In 1980, I was appointed to the District of Columbia Circuit Court of Appeals by President Jimmy Carter. And in 1993, I was appointed to the US Supreme Court by President Bill Clinton, where I served until I passed away on September 18th, 2020, just about two years ago. I worked until the very end. I was still conferring on cases on September 11th. After I passed away, I was the first woman to lie in state in the Capitol. I thank Marty for my seat on the Supreme Court. He was my first reader and critic of my articles, speeches, and briefs. He fully shared the household chores and the child care. And he did the cooking. 
we were pioneers of a new kind of family life in the 1950s. Please don't view me as perfect. I can't sing. <laughs> I can't do math. And I can't cook. My family forbade me from cooking. My children will tell you their memories of the meals I badly prepared. Also, sometimes I've made mistakes with my frank statements. In July 2016, I called presidential candidate Donald J. Trump a faker. Of course, he immediately called for me to step down from the Supreme Court. I quickly apologized and said my remarks were ill-advised. A sitting judge shouldn't comment on political candidates. But then, in October 2016, I was asked what I thought of football player Colin Kaepernick refusing to stand for the national anthem. I said I thought it was dumb and disrespectful. <laughs> Colin responded by saying he was surprised a Supreme Court justice would oppose a protest against injustice. I quickly apologized and said my remarks were inappropriately dismissive and harsh. I didn't know anything about athletes taking a knee, and I shouldn't have expressed an opinion. I'm not perfect. This is the book, Notorious RBG, and one of the co-authors is Shana Knizhnik, who coined the term. One of the joys of my judicial career was my friendship with Antonin Scalia, whose friends called him Nino. Nino and I were best buddies on both the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and the US Supreme Court. I was appointed to the circuit court in 1980, and he was appointed in 1982. In 1986, he was chosen for the Supreme Court, and I was chosen in 1993. Nino was an originalist. He believed the Constitution should be interpreted as the founders intended. I believed in a living constitution whose interpretation could change as society changed. Nino endorsed me for the Supreme Court. President Clinton went to him and asked which of the two candidates he was considering he'd rather spend time with on a desert island. <laughs> Lawrence Tribe, Harvard professor, or New York Governor Mario Cuomo, and Nino replied immediately, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> Nino had a wonderful sense of humor. He made me laugh all the time, which I loved because I was so, so serious. We both loved words. We would show each other our draft rulings to improve the wording. For example, U.S. versus Virginia, which is also known as the Virginia Military Institute case. I wrote the majority opinion permitting women to attend this public institution for the first time. And Nino wrote a dis dissent. And we exchanged rulings to improve the wording. <laughs> Nino and I were both passionate about opera. Our spouses got along beautifully, and we spent many New Year's Eves together and traveled together. Nino brought me roses on my birthday. And when Marty died, Nino shed tears on the bench of the Supreme Court. Nino helped me through my health care problems 
in the later years of my life. Our friendship wasn't puzzling to us. We disagreed in good spirit. We would joke about each other. He would say about me, what's not to like? Except her views of the law, of course. <laughs> I would say about him, I love him, but sometimes I want to strangle him. Notably, in 2017, we were given a prize for civility in public life by Allegheny College. I was introduced to opera as a child by conductor Dean Dixon, who wanted to enrich children's lives through early exposure to beautiful music and to opera. He organized, rehearsed, and conducted youth orchestras and presented condensed operas at New York City high schools. At age 11, I saw his production of La Gioconda, and I was spellbound. I wanted to be a diva. Operas told great stories. I got lost in opera. I could forget about the legal problems that consumed me day to day. I saw opera throughout the Washington, D.C. region, in Virginia, and in New York State. I traveled to see opera to San Francisco, Dallas, and Santa Fe. When Marty died, I went to the opera more often to console myself. I participated in three productions of the Washington National Opera. I had cameo roles in Ariadne, Oaf, Naxos, with Justice Scalia, and Die Flettermaus, with Justices Kennedy and Breyer, and I had a speaking role in La Fille du Régiment. Derek Wang was a 29-year-old law student when he decided he could write a humorous opera about me and Nino and our friendship and differences. When Derek took a constitutional law class, he read Nino's rulings and heard rage arias. When he read my rulings, he saw a beacon of light. The libretto of the opera is taken from our speeches and rulings, and you have in your legal handout on page four links to his website and to the law journal in which he published the libretto. It's also on the website. His musical inspirations were Handel, Mozart, Verdi, Offenbach, Bizet, Puccini, and other composers. He showed us excerpts in 2013, and the opera premiered in 2015, Scalia slash Ginsburg colon, a gentle parody of operatic proportions. Nino's rage aria begins, the justices are blind, how can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. When he was locked in a dark room for excessive dissenting, I came to rescue him, entering through a glass ceiling, noting that I have done this before. Later, my rage aria goes, you are searching in vain for a bright line solution to a problem that's not so easy to solve. But the beautiful thing about our Constitution is that, like our society, it can evolve. The theme of the opera is, we are different, we are one. We were different in our interpretations of written texts, 
we were one in our reverence for the Constitution and the institution we served. Scalia Ginsburg has been broadcast on the radio and performed in cities across the US and elsewhere in the world. People ask me sometimes, why is Scalia's name first? He had seniority. Seniority counts on the Supreme Court. He was appointed in 1986. I was appointed in 1993. I began visiting Santa Fe in the 1980s with Marty and later my family. I attended the Santa Fe Opera from 1996 through 2018. The opera was founded by John Crosby in 1956 on a former guest ranch of 199 acres, seven miles north of Santa Fe. The theater is open air and now seats over 2,000 people. Every summer, they host a rotating repertory of five operas, each preceded by a preview buffet dinner and a discussion about that night's opera. I learned about the opera from Judge Oliver Seth, who served on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver. I was the liaison from the Supreme Court to the Tenth Circuit, so he and I were in touch. I also knew his wife, Jean, who opened the first art gallery on Canyon Road, and their daughter, Laurel, who also became a gallery owner. Laurel's sister, Sandy, is an artist in Taos. At the opera, I visited with the artists during intermissions and after the performance. At the opera, I was accompanied by a retinue of U.S. Marshals who were huge. <laughs> At the opera, I was treated like royalty. I received a standing ovation wherever I went. Frankly, I have received standing ovations wherever I've gone for the last few decades. When I went to Santa Fe, I stayed busy. Jean, Seth, and Laurel organized events for me. Several years ago, for example, I visited museums and galleries. I hiked the hills and climbed the ladders at Bandelier National Monument. Now I know, I'm old and ailing, but I'm fit. I had a fitness trainer for over 20 years. I visited Georgia O'Keeffe's home in Abiquiu. I officiated at a same-sex wedding. I met sculptor Juan Hamilton at his Canyon Road studio. As you may know, he was an assistant to Georgia O'Keeffe for many years. I met a Bataan Death March survivor and a former governor of Taos Pueblo. There were two exciting events in 2016. I moderated Justice at the Opera at the Lenzik Theater, a series of legal scenes in operas performed by Santa Fe Opera apprentices. And I was the keynote speaker at the New Mexico State Bar Association annual meeting, which was rescheduled and held in Santa Fe so people could hear me speak. There were 900 or 1,000 people there. At those events, I was interviewed by distinguished attorney Roberta Cooper Ramo. Perhaps you know of her. Um, Dr. Barry Ramo on KOAT, remember him? Roberta Ramo was the first woman president of the American Bar Association and the first woman president of the American Law Institute. And she became a friend. I love New Mexico. I have many friends in New Mexico. And New Mexico loved me back. When I passed away, Roberta Ramo 
published an article in the State Bar Bulletin about my visits to Santa Fe and our friendship, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham lowered all flags to half staff. And the Santa Fe Opera dedicated one of my favorite seats to my memory. Thank you. <laughs>